I want to call this sermon the gift of mystery, because I believe it is a gift. If certainty is a curse, mystery is a gift. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So God makes everything beautiful in its time, and he's mapped out all of eternity, and yet we can't even begin to fathom God's timeline and what God is doing. I think Ecclesiastes, like many other books in the Bible, has an ultimate goal of humbling humankind so that we do rely on God, so that we learn the, the beauty of trust, trust in God. St. Augustine reminds us that if we're talking about God, we shouldn't be able to understand. What is it? Or rather, what wonder is it that you do not understand? If you do understand, that's not God. That's one of my favorite Augustine quotes. I, I quote St. Augustine a lot, considering I don't actually affirm some of his theological underpinning. But, but I do think he was a great leader in the early church. And some of what he said is fantastic. And this is one of those quotes that's just so good. If you're talking about God, why would you be surprised if you can't understand God? That's God you're talking about. If you understood it, it wouldn't be God. Does that make sense? Who wants to worship a God that fits in the box inside your brain? It's just not possible. Which reminds me of a great story. John Cavanaugh, if you don't know that name, he was a former president at the University of Notre Dame. And he went to Calcutta, India to visit Mother Teresa on a trip one time, toward the end of his life. And he waited in a long line to get to meet with her. And when he finally got FaceTime with Mother Teresa in person, his request was this. Mother Teresa, please pray for my clarity. Pray that God would give me clarity. And so Mother Teresa said, no. And as you might imagine, John Cavanaugh was a little disillusioned by that. And he said, I've traveled all the way here to India and waited to get time with you to ask you for this one request. Just pray for my clarity. And she said, no. So, of course, he asked, why? Why would you not pray for me? And she said, I'll pray for you, but I won't pray for clarity because that is clearly the last thing God needs you to let go of. Mother Teresa understood that. John Cavanaugh had to endure what John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. Anybody ever heard that phrase, the dark night of the soul? Not to be confused with the dark night Batman. Uh, so, although... <laughs> Well, there's probably some strange overlap there on a philosophical level, but, but this is something from St. John of the Cross, a Spanish mystic from hundreds of years ago. He coined the term related to a poem that he wrote, a really beautiful poem with a full commentary. You should read it sometime, The Dark Night of the Soul. But it's basically his journey of, of doubt and confusion and anxiety and fear about life and about God and his beliefs and everything else. And by the end of all that, he came to believe that all that mattered was trust. That in a dark night of the soul, all you can really do is trust God. Hang on in hope. Believe that the light will lead you through the darkness. And so we call that the dark night of the soul. Mother Teresa experienced her own dark night of the soul from roughly 1948 until nearly the time of her death. She said she never had clarity. She never really knew if she was doing what God wanted her to do. All those years she served as a missionary, as a faithful nun, a bride of Christ serving the poor and the destitute and the needy. And all that while, she never really knew, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? And yet she's the only Christian celebrity I know of who's never been the butt of a joke on SNL or Mad TV. Why is that? Maybe it's because she really trusted God. There was no pretense. There was no faking it, no show. That's why Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, everybody alike, even non-Christians can respect Mother Teresa because they see in her someone who simply trusted God and did what was good, what was right. That's what a dark night of the soul requires of us, that we give up answering our questions, the need for certainty. We have to enter into a place of wandering, confusion, place of mystery that feels uncertain. We ask, how can I know? I need to know. I need to know. I need to be certain. And the dark night of the soul says, no, you don't. This is a space God brings you into so that you let go of the need to be certain. And it is a gift, although it's a scary one to receive. I used to say, 
facts over feelings a lot. Like to the point that it was probably obnoxious to people who know me. Facts over feelings. I said it a lot in Bible college and seminary. Facts over feelings. Facts over feelings. What, and what did I mean? I, I think about that sometimes. I think what I meant was that I believed thinking has to come before feeling. That feelings are transient, given to change and be altered. But facts, facts are true. Empirical, logical, evidential facts. I can rely on facts and figures I can't rely on my emotions and my feelings. And so I convinced myself facts over feelings. Facts are more important than feelings. You need to think before you feel. But thinking, say, even saying I think, which I say a lot, I, well, I think, that is a bluff. Just to say, well, I think, is like striking a pose. It's pretending because there are no thinkings that happen before feelings. I want there to be because that would make life easier. But as a human being, I know it's not, it's not that way. Facts do not come before feelings. I may choose facts over my feelings, but there's no, to, no time at all that I think without feeling something. It's part of the bias of being a human, a sentient being. I have self-awareness. I feel. Whether I like it or not, I feel things. And what I thought about that really has kind of troubled me this week is that most often when I'm worried about what I think about something, what I understand about something, I'm actually disguising a deeper problem inside of myself. I think anyone who pretends to have a totally objective worldview, like I used to pretend, is disguising something, hiding something. Usually it's fear. For me, that's what it was. It was fear. It was insecurity. And I was cloaking it, covering it up, and striking the pose of, oh, well, I think this, and I think that, and it must be true. And I, I tried to understand my way through life or make meaning without feelings. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Who wants to live, really? And that's the whole point of this sermon, I guess. Who wants to go on living with false confidence? I mean, is that really what you want, the rest of your life, to keep pretending that you understand your life and what you're supposed to do and what everyone else is supposed to do and who God really is? Who wants to go on pretending they get all of that, that it all makes perfect sense to them and live with that sort of false confidence, which really is disguising inner fear? The good news is that Jesus says you don't have to. You don't have to disguise your fear. You don't have to pretend you understand to follow Jesus. He never says that. He never says you have to be certain. He never says you have to get it or understand it or make sense of it. He never judges you based on what you've been able to comprehend. Rather, he judges you on faithfulness to him loyalty to him, trust. Do you trust him? Even when you don't understand. That is a gift. It's a gift because I've realized I can't understand it. So either I'm left wanting or God gives me an out, and the out is faith. Just trust me. It is a gift. We have to admit as humans that we feel before we ever think. Most of the wonderful blessings in my life have to do with feelings more than they do with thinking. Even if I think a lot about it, about relationships and people in my life, those thinkings grow out of my feelings. And the feelings are much harder to explain, to quantify. We have a religious word for this, and it's the word mystery. It's been used since the earliest history of the church. Mystery, with a capital M. If you can't appreciate that there's something of God you'll never understand, then you can't really follow Jesus at all. Because you're not trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to understand something that's not for you to understand. This is tough because it means I have to be vulnerable. I have to give up control. I have to admit that I don't have the answers. Again, it's really a gift to admit that, but it's hard to do. And yet in mystery, in the unexplainable, I find the most beautiful aspects of my life. The things I care the most about often fall under that purview of mystery. Surely every good thing about God fits that definition, something I can't explain, something beyond my comprehension, something indescribable. To embrace mystery is to live in a space without control. I've been working on this a lot with our kids, one of our kids in particular. I won't name her, uh, but (laughs) she, she likes to be in control. Maybe it's an older sibling thing. She's, you know, she is the firstborn, but I won't tell you who she is. But she, she likes control. And what I've had to confess just a few nights ago, sitting on the floor talking to her, and it was one of those 
difficult conversations after a, a bad week at school and at home. And uh, I had to look at her and say, I understand this because it's me. You're doing the same things I do as an adult, but these are the things I do that ruin my life, that make relationships worse, that make me feel bad. I'm trying to help you at a young age stop doing this stuff, stop trying to control everything and control the people around you. If you can let go of that now at eight years old, you'll feel a lot better when you're grown. But God was really trying to teach me a lesson in that moment. It was ironic that I was writing a sermon about mystery and giving up control when I'm one of the most controlling people I know. It's brought harm into my life, my marriage, my parenting, friendships. I want to know. I want to control. I, I don't like to be vulnerable and to live in a space where I'm not in control. And maybe some of you have that same problem. I had a friend in Tennessee, it was an older lady at church. It's the first church I pastored up in the mountains. And she would always say, if the Lord wills. Because I'd say something like, we're going to have a potluck meal Wednesday night, come out and join us. And she'd say, if the Lord wills. And she'd say that all the time. And it, it really got under my skin. I know it's from the Bible. That I know it's a Bible quote. You know, don't say we will do business in such and such town, but say, if the Lord wills. I know. You don't have to send me a text later. Like, that's in the Bible. I know that. I know that. Okay. I know the Bible, okay? The problem is I don't like the Bible sometimes. Uh, I don't like what it says sometimes. So if the Lord wills, I thought what she meant was I'm holier than you, right? I don't even make plans without saying if the Lord wills. It just felt pretentious. And maybe there was a little bit of that. But as the years have gone on, I've thought back to that woman. And she was a very peaceable lady, very calm, never seemed to get very anxious. And now I wonder if it's because she always reminded herself that it's the Lord's will in the end. There was something in her that refused to take control over her day-to-day -day life, that always had to remind herself with that little quip, if the Lord wills. You know, I want to do this, I want to do that, if God allows it, but it's really not always up to me. That sort of humility to say, I'm not in control of this. It wasn't her saying, God controls every detail of your life. She wasn't teaching some strict five-point Calvinism or something. She was teaching a much simpler and more profound truth than that. I'm not in control of my life. That's really hard for me to admit. I know it's true. Like deep in here, I know I'm not in control. But for that to make its way from down here up to my brain and actually make sense to me and then into my heart where I really believe it, that's a long journey. And it's a difficult one. But I have to admit it. I have to admit that I'm not in control. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus famously taught that God provides for flowers and birds. Flowers don't sit in a field and think, wow, how beautiful I am with these petals glowing in the sunshine. Flowers don't think about being flowers. Birds, I assume, don't think about being birds. They don't know what it means to be what they are, let alone think about day by day what they're going to do and where they're going and what their plans are and what degree they're going to major in and what job they hope to have and how they're going to pay these bills and what house they're saving up for and how their kids are going to turn out when they leave the home and how they're going to get over this terminal illness and uh, you know, are they going to get treatments or just embrace it? And what do we do when they lose their job? They don't think about any of that, right? They don't think about anything except being a bird, and they don't even know what that means. So they really don't think. And Jesus says, be like that. Be like a flower. Be like a bird. And I want to say, no, that's stupid. I'm not a bird. I'm not a flower. I don't say that because it's Jesus. So I got a little more tact than that. But, <laughs> but he knows I thought it even if I don't say it, right? I can pretend, but he knows what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm not a flower. I'm not a bird. I can't help it. I think about the future. I worry about what I am and who I'm becoming. How could you not? And Jesus says, but look at how they glorify God without trying to. They just are, and because they are, they honor a God who is. Now, I still don't fully understand that, but I'm wrestling with it. How can I surrender like a flower? How do I surrender like a bird and just let God care for me and be the person he made me to be and not think so much about it? Why, why do I have to control the story of my own life's narrative? Gregory of Nancy Ansis, he said, to have knowledge of God is to walk on the edge of a vast mystery. To have knowledge of God is to walk on the edge of a vast mystery. That's beautiful and scary. He meant it 
as a word of solace, but also a word of concern, that there are many people who are unwilling to walk upon the edge of vast mystery. And yet that's what is required if we're to really trust and follow Jesus. He brings us into that place of mystery. As we journey into the divine, into this great mystery, we find ourselves called not to understand, but to experience union with God. This union is illustrated in two ancient Christian concepts, some that you might have grown up with. The beatific vision, if you're Catholic, or theosis, if you're Orthodox. Many of you are not either, so I'll tell you what they mean. But beatific vision is basically the assuming of God's glorified state after death in the kingdom of heaven. So we are made beautiful like God, right? We're, we are brought into the glory of God, and we see God for who God is, and by extension, we finally understand who we are, and the Catholic Church has called that for centuries now, the beatific vision. There's also theosis in the Eastern Church, which is the same idea. We are swallowed up into the divine after death or judgment or whatever comes next. At the end of all of it, we're swallowed up in, into the divine. We become part of this glorified state with God, and we become who we were always meant to be, and this is called theosis, to be one with God. Protestants call it different things. We, sometimes we just generically say going to heaven, and that's kind of what we mean. Others say glorification. Whatever you call it, we have all these words, but, but it's not a word, right? You can't quantify it with a word. We're just trying to explain the unexplainable. What does it mean to be one with God? What does it mean to assume all that I was meant to be and made to be? I can only imagine that. So God, who knows that my imagination is dull, gave me illustrations in real life. And he uses them throughout the Bible. One of them that you've all heard is parenting. I'm a dad. I have three kids. How many of you in here are parents? Not to exclude those who aren't, but I knew there are a lot of you. If you are a parent, then like me, I hope you would admit you have no idea what you're doing. And you, only re you realize that more as time goes on. It's not like, ah, I finally figured out how to parent. It just took me a few years. It's like a few years in, you think, I really don't know what I'm doing. I started to think I had an idea. And yet God helps. We, we do learn each day, although as we learn, we're further humbled. We are learning. We are growing. You do become, hopefully, a better parent in time. But it happens while you're just loving your children, while you're watching them grow and you yourself are growing alongside them. It just sort of happens. You know what God doesn't do? He doesn't wait until you're a good parent and then give you kids. He makes you experience it, trial by fire. And it is certainly one of, if not the greatest blessing in life, to be a parent. And by extension, the other half of that would be marriage, right? We'll talk about that one next. Most children couldn't explain, think about this, most children couldn't explain why they are so loved by their parents or maybe even why they love their own parents. If you were to ask your kids when you go home, whatever age they are, why do you love me, and why do you love me and not someone else? It would be hard to quantify that. It would be hard to define that, to put that into words. And you might say, well, you're kind, you're funny, you know, throw out some adjectives, but that's not really gonna capture it, right? Because you can't put in a Hallmark card what a parent or child feel for one another in a loving relationship. That is a mystery that we take for granted on a daily basis. And yet God uses that description of God's self, that he's the perfect parent, a heavenly father. He's trying to help us understand that this is a mysterious sort of connection that you can't really quantify, but it is true. It's as true as anything you've ever known, even though you can't quite explain why it's so true. Amazing. I couldn't prove to you, I couldn't explain adequately why I love my kids so much. But I really love my kids. Like I would do things I couldn't dream of doing for those kids. And most of you, if you're parents, I assume would say the same thing. Parenting brings out something in you that you might not have even known was there. A, a fierce sort of loyalty and protective instinct and a desire to, to see someone flourish. Kids make us more selfless. They teach us love but I couldn't explain how or why, I just, it just is, and it is in such a remarkable way. I think God is like that. Marriage is another example. Uh, much like parenting, I have no idea what I'm doing as a husband. 
uh, I, I think I figure it out, and then I'm wrong again. So it's really, it is a lot like being a parent. In Ephesians 5, Paul helps me uh, prove a point in this sermon. He literally says, marriage is a great mystery. And then later says, and it's just like God with Christ and his church. That's the whole point. Marriage is a picture, a, an earthly, as, as we sometimes say, an earthly picture of a heavenly reality, right? Marriage is a little snippet, a little, uh, little tiny boxed up example of the, the majesty of the mystery of God. Marriage is never about absolute certainty in another person. I never fully certainly know what is in my wife's brain, what she's thinking, what she's feeling, what her plans are. I know some of it, and I, I gained some intuitive abilities over the years. We've been married just shy of 11 years now. I think I know her pretty well. I know her better than any of you would know her, and that is also a powerful thought but I still don't really know her, right? There's a bit of mystery there. No matter how long you're married, you never fully, 100%, with certainty, know your spouse. Even in the best, longest standing, most healthy relationships. Because marriage isn't about certainty in the other person. It's about deepening union with another person. It's about growing together, learning to trust another person, which is a lot harder than just knowing about them. Two people as the Bible says, become one flesh. Two become one. That's a journey of trust, where each partner learns to embrace the mystery of the other partner. You grow together in love and through vulnerability. The healthiest marriages, the strongest marriages, are the most vulnerable marriages, where people have really let their guards down and let another person in. This is also true with friendship. You know, leave out the intimate part, leave out the living together, and this is true of most of your closest friendships. You become vulnerable with another person over a long amount of time, and you grow close, you grow tight together, and the two almost become one. Certainly, you've got, you've got a friend in your life. I hope you have a friend in your life that you could say that about, someone that you really trust, or someone who really trusts you, even if it's not a spouse. We commit to that person. We grow in this mysterious way together. And no one can quite explain what makes an old friend an old friend. No one can explain why they love their spouse the way that they do. You can't really put that into words. Like I said, you can mention some adjectives. Oh, he's so strong and provides for us and, and always compassionate, or she's so beautiful and kind and funny. and You know, all of that's good and true, but that's not why you love a person. There are plenty of people out there who are wise and funny and compassionate and kind and work hard and make more money, or they're funnier, or they're kinder, Right? You, could, you could compare apples to oranges, but that, it doesn't work like that. Why? I don't know. I, I don't think anyone knows. That's the point. You can't explain that. But it is an amazing gift. Irenaeus said, the greatest mystery of God is that he reveals himself to those who seek not to understand him, but to love him. The greatest mystery of God is that he doesn't reveal himself to the ones who try to understand him, but to those who just want to love him. I think that is one of the truest state statements I've ever heard. I understand God better now than I ever have, and I ask him less questions than ever before. I'm just trying to learn what it looks like to love and to be obedient. I'm not trying to understand it all, and I feel like God has pulled me in close in a, a very mysterious way, but I count it a gift. Marriage and parenting serve then as, as those earthly pictures of the heavenly reality. The ancient Christians, because they couldn't define the Trinity, really, they came up with a, a word, it's a pretty cool word, it's perichoresis. Now, choresis is the same word from which we get choreography, so you should think dancing. Perichoresis means the infinite dance of God, now, this is wild, but this is what the earliest Christians came up with, and we still believe this to be true. God, Father, Son, and Spirit are not three separate beings, right? They are one, and yet there are three persons, and no one can explain that. So the early church said it's like a divine dance that never ends. These three dance partners always intertangled together, and there is no dance without all three of them participating. The dance wouldn't happen, but they're always all dancing together in perfect unity, 
and yet they are still three separate people, but they are one as they dance together, and it's something beautiful to behold. And the ancient church kind of explored that idea, and it, and it is beautiful to think about. It's really quite remarkable when you say, well, what's the Trinity? Like when kids say, how is God three in one? You tell them, well, you know, like three dancers together forever and ever that just make this beautiful dance. And you can't really quite understand it or pin it down, but it, it, is, it is beautiful. It's amazing. Something like that. That's the best we've got. For almost 2,000 years now, that's the best we've come up with. Each person of the Trinity indwells the others in harmony. There's mutual exchange of love and glory. It's a reflection of the unexplainable. It's our attempt at understanding God. Unity without fusion. Diversity without division. That's good stuff. I think it is a mystery that's captivated the church for hundreds and hundreds of years. Who is God really? What is God? And at the end of the day, we have no idea. Is God the energies that imbue all that is? Because ontologically, God is being itself? Yeah. Is God my Father in heaven who cares for me as a child? Yeah. Is God the spirit, the wind, the ruach that blows along and you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going and it moves in ways, changes circumstances, heals people, sets people free? Yeah. Is God a judge who will vindicate the righteous and punish wickedness and destroy evil? Yeah. Is God a son? Yes. He's, it's all these things. How do you reconcile all that? It is a mystery. And so Christians from the beginning said, if you can't reconcile all these things, then you have to admit they are a mystery. And if you won't admit that, if you think you can understand everything about God, you can't be a Christian. You will be cut off from the body of Christ. Anathema. I understand why now. Because I think that's true. If you really believe you can understand God, that your God is the right one in your brain and everyone else is automatically wrong, because you are so certain, how could you love your neighbors as yourselves? How could you love God if the God you love is a figment of your imagination that you've inboxed? I don't think inboxed is a word, but I just made it up. You've put him in a box, right? Enveloped inside of your own brain. That's no God at all. That's not really God. How can you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength if the God you love is a God you understand? That's not really God. And then you can't love your neighbors as yourselves because their God's different than yours. But if God is something you know you can't understand, bigger than you, well, then you could come to know God through faithful obedience, through loving your neighbors. Again, it is a mystery, and it requires us being vulnerable. But, man, all these things, these visions of, of God's beauty and unity and this mysterious stuff that we're talking about, it is a beautiful contrast to the ugly stuff that this world keeps presenting to us again and again. The world is kind of a hideous place. God is beautiful. The world is fractured. God puts things together. We need this mystery. We need the unfathomable, interwoven love that is God. It's a kingdom that we're invited into, a place where the beauty of God is unveiled as the mystery of God is received. But it's a scary thing to step into mystery. And yet love is only ever known by those who take the risk. The only people who ever really love at all are people who are willing to be vulnerable. And I think that place cultivates a sense of wonder, a sense of awe. It makes us want to worship God, who is both intimately knowable and infinitely, endlessly mysterious. So God is intimately knowable and infinitely mysterious. And I think that's really cool. Because the end goal of humankind is to trust and worship God forever, which the church has pretty well always agreed on all across the world, the end goal of humans is to trust and worship God forever. If that's our goal, then we should expect God to take us into a space that teaches us how to do that, how to trust and worship God and be in awe of God forever. And I think that only comes to pass in a place of mystery when we let go of control. So to sort of sum this up and give you a real life example, how many of you have ever worked in uh, like an office building of some kind? Basically anywhere that have fluorescent lights. 
Anybody ever work under fluorescent lights, like a day-to-day -day job? Or maybe you lived in a house, God forbid, that had fluorescent lights. Okay, so how many of you, raise your hands again if you worked in that environment. Keep your hands up if you hate fluorescent lights. Okay, pretty much everybody. Why do you hate them? Migraines. They give you migraines? Nothing looks real. Everything looks weird, right? Nothing is quite real. Nothing looks correct. Anything else? Okay, don't jump the gun, Rob. Uh, he, said, or poor, he said it's a poor substitute for the sun. Well, that's where I'm going. So fluorescent lights are disappointing to us because we have seen sunlight. And when you've seen the real thing, the unexplainable, the beauty of it, the magnitude of it, to sit in a cubicle under fluorescent bulbs, who wants to be there? Who wants, who wants to sit there trapped under something fake, man-made, not real, right? It's not really real. Now, I can explain how a fluorescent bulb works. I've changed out ballasts and fixtures multiple times. I've installed fluorescent lights in a dentist office once as a job. It was, you know, helping my cousin. I know more than I want to know about fluorescent lights, especially given how much I hate them. And I'm telling you, all that I know about fluorescent lights doesn't make me appreciate them anymore. It doesn't make me like them anymore. Knowing about them didn't do anything for my feelings about them. But I don't know much of anything about the sun. I remember a lot of ping pong balls that were supposed to be the earth could fit inside of the sun on Bill Nye, the science guy show when I was in school. I remember the, the sun is really big, basically. I remember that it's a big ball of burning gas and that we are heliocentric in our solar system. So we, we circle around the sun in pat, you know, circular patterns, right? I remember some of that from school. That's about it. I don't really know much else about the sun. But even if I did, it wouldn't make me appreciate the sun anymore. Because what I appreciate about the sun isn't the stuff I know about it. It's the experience of sunlight. It's being in the sun. It's when I go out to Oo McIntyre Park to watch Hudson play on a little kindergarten soccer league, and it's chilly, and the wind's blowing through the trees, and then we step out into the flat part, and the sun beams down, and everyone sitting there is like, oh, it feels good today. Wow, that sun is nice. What are they talking about? They're not talking about how hot the gases are burning so many light years away. They're just saying it just feels good. It's just great. It keeps the grass growing. It gives the photosynthetic abilities to leaves, right, to, to grow and then change color eventually and drop, drop dead and then grow again, resurrected in the spring and all, the, all these beautiful things that happen because of sunlight. It keeps us alive. It keeps us warm. I don't need to understand it. I just need to experience it. Is this making any sense? That's the best analogy I could come up with this week for why I think God needs to remain a mystery in your life. John Chrysostom said, it's not for us to try to understand the incomprehensible. Let us rest in the comfort of his mystery. Sunshine, if you think about it too much, may seem threatening, hot, even a bit unpredictable. But to anyone who has been locked away under fluorescent light bulbs, sunshine is a gift beyond belief. Step into the light. Or as that lady in Tennessee would say, let go and let God, which is not a Bible verse, so I'm allowed to not like that one. Uh, and, and I didn't. There was another phrase I used to make fun of, let go and let God. And, uh, you know, I was full of hubris. Now, as a humble man, I recognize that is one of the most faith-filled statements I've ever heard. Let go and let God. I've heard hardly anything more demanding in my life than that statement, let go and let God. I think I hated it, not because that's not even in the Bible. That was, once again, me projecting and covering my insecurity. I hate that phrase because I don't like what it says, to let go and let God. I don't like that. I don't want to let go. I want to hold all of it. And God says, I have this really great gift for you, but in order to receive it, you have to let go of all the stuff you're holding. And I'm like that's the monkey with the banana in the jar that's like just won't let go, right? And so you can't get the banana out. <laughs> and if he would just let go, then he could dump the banana right into his hand and everything would be fine. He doesn't need to understand how jars work. He just needs to let go. I never really thought of it like that. And now I feel embarrassed. <laughs> I'm basically a stupid monkey.
Letting go, really letting go, is a gift. It's a gift. Give God your control, your fear, your worry, your unanswered questions, your doubts. Embrace all that stuff, acknowledge all that stuff, don't pretend you don't feel it, but then give it to God and see what he will give you in return. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And that reminds me of the words of James. Submit yourselves to God. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. No offense, but I think James was just repeating what he had heard from Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, let me help you carry this. You don't have to hold it all on your own. That is the gift of mystery, to let Jesus help me carry it and not, not understand where it's going or how it works, but knowing he's there to help me. That is a gift, maybe the greatest gift you'll ever receive. I'd like to close with the words of Psalm 139, just part of the psalm, verses 1 through 16. And then I have five points to make. And I'm not joking, but they're very brief. Uh, so this is the whole sermon now. That was all the introduction. Uh, and here's, here's the sermon. Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I can't attain it. Where could I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that means the pit of death, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light becomes the night around me. That's a better Hebrew translation. The night becomes, or rather the light becomes night around me. Even when my days become dark. This is the dark night of the soul. That's what the psalmist is talking about. When I don't know what's going on and I can't see, I can't. I can't understand. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day because darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And we'll stop there. The word of the Lord through the pen of the psalmist. That is a scripture of comfort. Five points based on that psalm. First, God knows what I cannot understand. God already knows what I cannot understand. Second point, God is there when I feel alone. God is always there, even when I feel isolated. Third point, God is light, even when I'm surrounded by the dark. God is the light even when I'm lost in darkness. That darkness to God is as light. There is no darkness in God. Fourth, God has ordained my existence. I'm only here because God has numbered my days, because God wanted to create me. Even in my mother's womb, he knit me together. You're only here because God wanted you to be here. And finally, God has plans for my future. He knows where all of this is going even though I don't. That is a comfort. 
He doesn't tell me the answer to any of those things. He just reminds me that it's all true and that I can trust him. 